Welcome to our summer series of Mundo Monday. Remember this? This was our beanstalk from 1,000 books before kindergarten. Preschoolers got to climb higher and higher into the clouds the more books they read. We're going to journey into the clouds of our imagination this summer, too. Our summer theme is Imagine Your Story. But before we do, I'd like to introduce you to someone who will be keeping us company on our journey. Hello! Hi. Hello! Everyone, meet the actual Mundo Monday. Mundo means world, and that's what I am. The whole world and everyone in it. There are many different people in the whole world, and they all have stories to tell. I was just pointing out our beanstalk. Oh, England. What? Stories from England, Jack and the Beanstalk. Just a little spot on the back of my head, see? Uh, there. But that a country has a big influence on your culture in Pennsylvania. Uh, you got a little uh, beanstalk growing out of PA there. England was a great conqueror once. It took over countries all over the world and built a huge empire, including in what is now called the United States of America. That's why you speak English today. And that's why so many people know this story of Jack and the Beanstalk. A story about a boy named Jack who traded his cow for five beans. He planted the beans and they grew overnight. They grew and grew all the way to the sky. So Jack climbed the beanstalk and discovered a whole new land above the clouds. There he saw a huge, huge castle. He went inside and found a magic harp that played and sang by itself. And a goose that laid golden eggs. But then he heard a thunderous voice. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. See, England. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Jack did not want to be eaten, so he grabbed the magic harp and the goose and ran. But the giant was right behind, so Jack slid all the way home and cut down the beanstalk while the giant was still on it, and he fell to his doom, so the harp sang, the goose laid golden eggs, and Jack lived happily ever after. But most people don't realize that in the whole world, there are a lot of different Jacks and some Jills. No matter where you live, what language you speak, or even what you eat, Everyone feels small sometimes. So people all over the world have told stories about someone very small who has to escape someone huge and scary. Oh, like this book. Fearsome Giant, Fearless Child, a worldwide Jack and the Beanstalk story by Paul Fleischmann. This is one story, but it's made up of bits and pieces of all the many different small person against the huge monster stories from all over the world. You can look at a map of them all here. See the map? That's a lot of stories. There are stories from the United States, from Chile, from Gambia, from Ethiopia, from Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, Mongolia, Russia, from Norway, Denmark, Germany, Turkey, Italy, France, and of course, England. See if you can spot them all. Fearsome Giant, Fearless Child, a worldwide Jack and the Beanstalk story. It was scary. But I begged for that story, how the king adored his other children but could barely stand to look at his younger son, or how he was the youngest of 12, or the youngest of 13, how the woman with seven brawny sons gave birth to an eighth 
It was no bigger than a finger. The parents were amazed at their inch-long baby. He was so quiet that everyone took him for stupid, but hungry is what he was. For there wasn't enough food to feed them all. The parents knew something had to be done. So the father led his son into the jungle and left him. The boy lost his way among the trees. Then deep in the forest, he spied a palace. He entered and found a meal waiting on the table. Famished, he ate it, then felt the ground shake. A giant flung open the door. I smell a man whom I will eat. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. The brothers lay down to sleep in the witch's house, but the youngest knew that she meant to eat them all, so he told his brothers to exchange their white robes for the blue robes worn by the witch's daughters. And then he switched his brother's sleeping caps with the crowns that the ogre's daughters wore. When the ogre came in in the dark of night, it felt for the caps and it killed its own daughters. The little one's brothers were jealous of his cleverness. They told the king that the boy could do anything, hoping he'd be given a quest that would end his life. Find the princess's thousand pearls scattered in the forest, or else you'll be turned to stone. Steal the wish-granting jewel that his majesty keeps on his mouth at night. Bring me the man-eater's prize bowl. Each time, the boy succeeded, and each time the king then asked for something new. The lad crept into the monster's house once more, this time to steal his bell-covered pillow. But the moment he touched it, the bells began ringing. The horse began to speak. Help! This boy is stealing me! The lad watched the golden harp sing a lullaby that put the giant to sleep. He had already stolen the giant's sacks of gold and his hen that lay golden eggs. Mad to have the harp, he grabbed it and ran. Master! cried the harp. Wake up! The ogre jumped into his magic boots that let him cover seven leagues at a stride and took off after the brothers. The youngest brother heard the witch racing through the forest behind them. Over his shoulder, he threw an egg that cracked and became a river blocking her way. But the witch called her oxen who drank up the river. On she raced. He heard the devil galloping on his heels and he dropped a piece of gravel into his mule's ear. Quick as lightning, the whole country behind him turned into boulders. The devil had to go back and fetch a gold hammer to crack himself a path. And by that time, the lad was gone. Now the witch, she was so mad that she burst into pieces. But that speck of a lad, he became king. The older brothers finally thanked him for saving their lives. And the Lord's daughter made a wish. And suddenly the boy grew to normal size. Never again was his family hungry. And everything worked out in the end. Indeed it did. Now calm yourself, child, and try to sleep. That's an interesting book. All those little pieces of stories make me curious to hear the whole things. Then I have good news. We have some of these stories right here at the library. See this bit from Japan? Japan is right there, over my right eye. Do you see it? See? About the one-inch boy? We've got that story right here in our folktale section. Izanboshi, the one-inch boy, retold and illustrated by Ikinori. Izanboshi, the one-inch boy. Once in a country far away, there lived a peasant farmer and his wife. They had no children, and every day to lift their spirits on the walk to and from the fields, they sang, We'd like a little boy, any size at all. We'd like him little, we'd like him small. We'd love him 
tiniest of all. And then a miracle happened. They had a child, but, and this hardly came as a surprise, he really was tiny. And they called him Isinbosi, the one inch boy. Years passed and Isinbosi became nimble and smart. He learned to dance, he learned to sing, and the country folk came to see the charming way he moved his little body. A hard-working boy, he helped his parents in the fields and they repaid him richly in love and gratitude. By the age 15, there was no denying it. He still hadn't grown, not an inch, not one tiny little bit. One day, Isimbosi said to his parents, I have decided to go in search of adventure. The world is big, especially for me. In the city, I will find a life that suits me well. His parents were much moved. His mother gave him a rice bowl, which he carried on his shoulders, and his father presented him with a beautiful needle, which he wore at his belt. Thus equipped, he was ready to go, and off he went. There he goes, down the river, through the wilderness, and to the world is so big, and Isambosi is so small. While Isambosi was gathering twigs in the forest to make a fire, all of a sudden, at a bend in the path, he came across a strange-smelling, strange-looking creature like none he'd ever seen before. Gigantic, hairy, and misshapen. The creature spoke. Tikiki, who are you? The little man was not afraid, and he answered, I'm Isimbosi, the one-inch boy. Oh, Tiki, <laughs> said the ogre, hopping from one foot to the other. I'll make you a deal. If you follow this stream, you will come to a city. In this city, you will see the grand house of a nobleman. In this house, you will find a beautiful treasure. And Tikiki, you'll bring it to me. Then my magic hammer, Uchiri no Kazuchi, he who grants wishes, will reward you with the height your parents forgot to give you. What do you say? Witted and honest, Isin replied, I shall go and see this city. I shall go and see this nobleman. But he'll keep his treasure, you'll keep your hammer, and I'll keep my tiny size. That way, we'll be quits. Good day to you. I must be on my way. On board his bull, sailing toward the city, Isin Bosi thought he could still hear the ogre's voice in the distance like an echo. Tikiki! Tikiki! Finally, Isimbosi arrived at the city. What a commotion! There were traders, horses, snakes, carts, men, birds, women, fruit, children, hustle and bustle all over the place. People running, people shouting, all of them nearly crushing little Boshi. And swiftly, with all his agility, he threaded his way through the crowd, hopping and skipping between all the legs and feet. Isimbosi found a grand house, as beautiful as can be, and he began to shout, Give me a job! I want to work! Roused by the noise, the whole household came running and was astonished to discover the origin of this strange din. Tiny little man, no more than an inch high. What good could you possibly be to me, you little pipsqueak? The nobleman asked, looking down from his balcony. And Isimbosi began to sing. And Isimbosi began to dance. Soon the whole neighborhood was watching this spectacle, and the crowd laughed, whistled, and clapped. Then a young girl appeared and cried out, Papa, I'm bored. Give me this little person, I beg you. He can read to me, sing me songs, keep me company. Exhausted by the hubbub, the nobleman gave in to his daughter and hired his Mbosi. From then on, Isimbosi accompanied the girl wherever she went. One day he would sing, 
the next he would dance. Time passed and he worked hard at inventing tricks and songs to entertain his young mistress. And she was delighted to have a doll that could read and think. But the little man began to say to himself that it might be nice, just once, to be not really bigger, but perhaps a little less tiny, so that she would view him differently, especially because she was very beautiful. One day, out walking in the forest, Isambosi was amusing the young girl by acting out the battle between the ant and the caterpillar. All of a sudden, the strange-smelling, strange-looking ogre appeared. Kiki, -ki, thank you, Boshi Boshi. At last you have brought me the treasure I asked you for. A thousand thanks, my little one. And with these words, he pulled the young girl under his arm and rushed off as fast as his legs would carry him. Quick runner, Isambosi soon caught up with them, leapt, gripped on tightly to the ogre, and bit him with all his might. Infuriated by this pesky midget, the ogre swallowed him whole. Deep down in the ogre's stomach, Isambosi felt a terrible anger rising within him. He seized his needle at his belt and plunged it into the giant's insides. He stabbed and slashed and stabbed again like a hornet, like a wasp. Nothing escaped him, neither the liver, nor the kidneys, nor the heart, nor even the throat. So much the monster doubled up with pain, spat him out again. Straight away, as quick as a flash, Isin grabbed the ogre's magic hammer, Uchide no ka... <clears throat> Uchide no ka Kazuchi, he who grants wishes. While the young girl and the ogre looked on in amazement, Isimboshi grew and grew and grew. The one-inch boy turned into a man who was tall and strong and, above all, terribly angry. Without his hammer, the ogre took fright and scurried off, whining, Saying that he can still be seen walking in the depths of the forest. A little tiny ogre nibbling grass to soothe his punctured insides. People say that his Mboshi sometimes misses being small and that he still treasures his bowl and his needle. People say that the nobleman's daughter has taken a different view of Ishimbosi and that their story is not yet. That was wonderful. I like that story from Japan. I can't wait until next week when we'll see even more stories from all over Mundo. Bye.